Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Which is an audio test. Um, if you can just let me know whether you can hear me um, clearly. If you can just type it out in the window. Okay, alhamdulillah. And you can see the slides as well, correct? Okay, great. Okay. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al aliy al azim. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al tahirin. So welcome to the uh, seminar. Um, we can't hear, I can't hear you, no. Um, the uh, topic of this uh, seminar is basic fasting rules. Um, I want to inshallah go through um, some of the main, uh, you know, questions that people have about fasting, some of the main areas where we get questions about. Um, and I'll be doing this on the basis of the rulings of two of the maraj, Ayatollah Sistani and Ayatollah Khamenei, Hafidahum Allah. Um, for those of you who might have joined us last year for this seminar, um, the structure is very similar and the content is similar. There's a few places where I've added a few things or um, maybe expanding on a few things. Um, one or two changes as well too um, when it comes to some of the rules about frequent traveling from Ayatollah Khamenei. But otherwise, um, you know, there's a few scenarios that I put in as well, too, but, but it's fairly similar to what it was um, in the previous year. Okay, in terms of the, um, the topics we want to cover, inshallah, um, this is the outline. First, we're going to look at a bit about the philosophy of fasting. That's not the topic of the seminar, but just as a motivation for us. Um, we're looking at the philosophy from the Quran and Hadith. And then we're going to look and see um, who has to fast and who is exempted from fasting. Um, what do I do if I have qada left over? And then um, the issue of penalties like the fidya and the kafara. Fasting and travel. And what are those things which break my fast? And if we have time, also um, looking at when do I fast, meaning that what do I do on the 30th of Sha'aban, if I'm not sure if that's the 30th or if it's the first of the month Ramadan. And then a bit about um, how should I fast, meaning about making the intention to fast. So a bit about the philosophy of fasting in brief. Let's look at a couple of the ayat of the Quran in brief. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, that um, the purpose for um, the fasting being wajib upon us is uh, so that you may be God weary. That's the English translation of لَعَلَّكُمْ تتقون. Meaning that um, one of the wisdoms behind the legislation of fasting is in order for us to uh, attain or increase our taqwa, our, um, the care that we take with respect to Allah. Um, why is that the case? Um, Mufassirin have mentioned that when you are in the state of fasting, then um, you are being trained um, to stay away from those things which the soul uh, desires. And you're forced to command your soul to listen to a higher authority. And throughout the month of Ramadan, um, if somebody gets used to doing this, then that's something that um, will lead to the acquisition or at least the it, it, or even more the, the improvement of one's taqwa, one's capability of, of observing the, the rights of God and, and um, of doing acts that please him and of being more aware of him as well. The other ayah, um, a couple of ayahs later in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says that um, and some of the more uh, wisdom behind the month Ramadan and fasting is وَلِتُكَبِّرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ that um, the purpose is that you may magnify Allah for guiding you and that you may give thanks. So this is an opportunity, um, a wonderful opportunity for us to um, become aware of and realize, and, and at least, um, you know, if we are already aware of it, to strengthen our awareness of um, Allah's blessings upon us and to respond with thankfulness. Now, um, some ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt, which explain 
um, these philosoph the philosophy of fasting even in more detail. Um, these are a couple of ahadith where um, Rasulullah says that the purpose of fasting is to sever the root of desire and to remove um, wildness. That's how it's been translated. Um, that again has to do with like the um, the control, the self-control that's imposed by the fasting at the very low level when it comes to you know eating and drinking and the other things that break the fast on a fiqhi level. But then at a higher level, those things that we're told to refrain from that would um, be contrary to fasting at an akhlaqi level, things like riba and things like um, you know looking at things which are inappropriate and so on and so forth. Um, the Prophet says in a famous hadith, sumu tasihu, that fast and you will be healthy. Um, it's amazing if you look at um, the amount of research that's being done, especially I found in the last um, couple of years, from very prominent uh, you know, scientific institutions, scientific journals, um, who are not, it's not for the purpose of, of, of Islam and Muslims. Um, it's, these are non-Muslims who are studying you know, different ways of how fasting helps the health. And um, it's been amazing how uh, recently I've seen that like they're, they're coming to the conclusion, the conclusion that for, for somebody to have like three to four weeks where um, they eat only in a certain part of the day and, and refrain from food for the rest of the part of the day, it can be a very, very um, healthy uh, thing for their body. And so, you know, we see that um, the saying of Rasulullah, it's something which is not just, you know, it wasn't just sort of to make the Muslims feel good. It was, I mean, he was speaking from truth and he's the prophet of truth. And um, now they're realizing like, you know, what sort of benefits the fasting can have for us. Of course, you know, everything has its own uh, way of doing it. And if we, if we take the fasting, but we don't actually observe the right amount of the right etiquette when it comes to eating and drinking, and then sometimes it can be worse for our health. Um, a couple of more of the, of the philosophies of fasting. Um, Imam Asghari says that um, it's so that the rich may experience the pain of hunger and uh, bestow his generosity thereby upon the poor. Um, another one, um, which is again very beautiful from Imam Radha is that fasting is a test um, so that we can attain ranks with Allah. And he can make us aware of the bounties of tasty water and good bread. These are things that we take for granted if we don't have um, this type of opportunity to uh, be deprived of it and then enjoy it afterwards. When they feel thirsty during the day they are fasting, they remember the great thirst of the hereafter and that encourages them towards obedience. So that's a, a great motivation for us to remember the akhirah um, in the course of fasting, inshallah, in the upcoming weeks. Okay, now um, let's start to look at some of the, the rules um, about fasting. The first um, topic is um, who has to fast and who is it that's exempted from fasting? So fasting during the month of Ramadan um, is one of the wajibat. Um, as long as somebody meets the conditions for it being wajib upon them, then it becomes a wajib. Now, the, it's wajib on every mukallaf. Mukallaf is somebody who, for whom the taklif is, um, is, you know, uh, is mandatory. The taklif meaning like the obligation, the responsibility. And um, one of the conditions for taklif, whether it be for fasting or for any other uh, wajib um, act, is that somebody should be sane and they should be balik, right? So anybody who's sane and they're balik, these are two conditions. And not being a traveler, um, we'll get into that in more detail. Um, for women only, um, being uh, clean from hayd and nifas, more about that later. Not being ill, we'll talk about that later as well. And then able to keep the fast. Being, if somebody is not able to do it, um, they're sick or they're just incapable or they're traveling, um, they're not balik, it's not something which is wajib. Okay, now what about a non balik You know, there's this question about whether it should be, is, is, is it the case that, you know, like that fasting is good for, for children who are not balik? Um, sometimes if we approach it from a, a layman perspective and we just try to do our own analogy, we say that we think to ourselves that, okay, well, if fasting is good for adults, then um, it's good for children as well. Um, so therefore, we should encourage our children to fast even if they're not valid. Um, but when it comes to this matter, we have to be very careful to look at the Ahlul Bayt as our guides and to see what they have to say on the matter. So we see that in this hadith from Imam al-Sadiq, he says that at the age of seven, we, being the Ahlul Bayt, we ask our children to fast to their capability, either half the day or more or less. And we order them to break their fast when they become hungry or thirsty. 
so just based on that part, um, did the Ahlul Bayt like um, encourage their children to bear the hunger and thirst, you know, beyond a certain point? The answer is no. They fasted according to their capability. Did they? Um, did they? Was it the case that it was better for their children to like keep long fasts the whole day? No. Um, they would keep half the day or more or less, but then they would order them. Would they have the opportunity to be able to keep the whole day of fast? Apparently not. Apparently, um, the, the children of the Ahlul Bayt would, would not keep full, full day fasts. This is so that they became used to fasting. Thus, you should ask, meaning everyone else should ask your children to fast at the age of nine. Now, my understanding of this is that the Ahlul Bayt are saying that, like, um, that, that, you know, that, uh, not that the, the actual exact age isn't the thing which is important here, but rather that by the age of nine, this is something that children should be, um, that we should be asking our children to do. Um, of course, if, the, if it's a female child, then it becomes, uh, according to the wajib, it's wajib, um, once she becomes badik. But for male children at the age of nine, by the age of nine, then we should be doing the same thing, meaning that we should ask them to fast according to their capability, either half the day or more or less. And when they become hungry or thirsty, then um, they break their fast. Now, um, if you want to just summarize that, um, the suggest, like the advice um, that we would give on the basis of what the ulama have said on the matter is that before a child, obviously when a child is badik, it's a different matter. Right? They're not, no longer considered a child. But when a child, from, from the perspective of taklif, um, the sharia, but when it comes to um, a child who's not badik, before they're physically able to fast, then we shouldn't even encourage the fasting. But after the physical maturity has developed, which is somewhere around, you know, seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, six years old, somewhere around there, depending. Um, but before coming of age, then we do the same thing Ahlul Bayt would do, which is that we uh, we command our children to break their fast when they are thirsty or hungry. Um, if we do this, then we'll see that um, the idea of being able to fast for a whole day will become something that the children really cherish. It's something which is a reward that they'll get when they become Balik, that today, the now that I'm nine years old for a girl, now that I'm say 13 years old for a boy, this was the first day I was able to keep a full fast. And that's something which becomes something to look forward to. Um, but if it's something that you know we we impose upon our children before they're ready, then um, it could in some cases backfire in the future. So we should avoid asking our young children, you know, are you fasting today? Some people like they have this habit whenever they see a young child, they're like, are you fasting today? They make them feel bad if they don't. They give them money or prizes if they are. Um, sometimes the community will will even like you know make it a big deal and they'll they'll give prizes to you know the children who have fasted the, the whole day. And this is something that we should discourage um, and it, because it's not something that Ahlul Bayt encourage us to do. Um, now, when it comes to a girl who's nine years old, like, this is a question that you know that people have. That okay, let's say she is balik, right? So now. Um, how can it be the case that a nine-year-old should be asked to fast? Well, um, first of all, uh, you know, we have to understand that um, the fasting is an obligation on those who are able to do it. If if she's not able to do it, um, if she's concerned um, about her health being damaged because of the fasting, um, if it's unbearable, then there's no obligation. Right? But if she is able to do it, then um, it is an obligation. Now, how can she do it? Well, the human body is amazing at being able to adapt. Um, it's happened for centuries and um, and in in, in uh, different seasons um, and in different parts of the world. Um, and uh, there's no reason why it can't happen this year as well. And one of the things that we've seen, you know, time and time again, is that when the whole community is is getting together, and this is something that we're all doing together, even if the days are very long. Um, and the nights are very short. It is something which um, is um, Allah gives them the ability to be able to perform this. Now, um, let's look at some of the exceptions. Okay, when is it that um, when is it that uh, you know, when is it that um, fasting is not uh, an obligation? So here, um, in this slide, we see that it says that what if fasting will make me sick or prolong or intensify my sickness or harm me? Okay, and we'll look at some of those examples in a bit here. 
Um, if it's the case that fasting is going to be harmful for my health, then um, I don't need to fast. And even if I'm not Let's say I'm not, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's a fear that I have. And that fear is based on rational grounds. You know, I have, I have a reasonable, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, and it's not just like, you know, some whim that I have. It's a legitimate concern that I have that this fasting is going to harm my health. In that case, it's not wajib on me to do that. I can make up the qadha later on. Um, if I'm sick and this fasting is going to cause me to get sicker, or even if it's not going to cause me to get sicker, but it's going to mean that my recovery is going to be prolonged or it's going to intensify my pain um, then uh, fasting is not an obligation in fact it's not even allowed for me to fast in that case now um does what what do we mean by what is meant by harm what's meant by harm is any type of um you know harm which is considerable you know like things like okay feeling hungry and thirsty while fasting well that's something which is expected that people are going to feel uh, hungry and thirsty feeling a bit more tired, you know, being grumpy, um, being off in terms of their mood. These are things which, you know, typically people experience, especially especially at the beginning, the first first few days of fasting before they get used to it. Um, but when it goes beyond that, um, that's when uh, it, you know, it's, it's grounds for not fasting. Okay, now let's look at some examples. Let's say that somebody, um, you know, they, they, they're not, they're not sick, but they have a heart issue. Okay, and they need to take heart medicine regularly. Okay, so let's say that by fasting, they won't be able to take that medicine because the medicine has to be taken like you know, um, orally. Um, and that could result in heart issues. Well, um, heart issues are harm. And anytime you have fear of harm, then it's not an obligation to fast. Okay, um, what about where somebody recovers from an infection and... Like I just recovered from infection and today is my day to recuperate. I'm not sick anymore, um, but it's just that, you know, I'm, I've just gone over my sickness and I, if I fast, I fear that I won't recuperate properly because I want, for example, you to have the right amount of liquids or, you know, whatever the reason may be. Um, in that case, I have fear of that infection coming back. Fasting is not, is not necessary. Um, it's invalid. Okay, I'm sick and I need to constantly drink fluids to get better. Again, fasting invalid. Now I have a mild cough and fasting might keep my throat feeling uncomfortable. That doesn't, that wouldn't qualify as one of those, you know, like the type of harm or, you know, like the, um, something that would be con considerable, you know, that, that would be a, a cause for somebody not fasting. Like what about the doctor's opinion? If a doctor says, does that mean that um, I would go by that whatever the doctor says? Well, the doctor's opinion um, we said that like whenever there's a fear of you know there being sickness or getting more sick or harm, you know that fear can come from the doctor's opinion. So let's say that I go over a checkup and the doctor tells me that fasting is not good for my diabetes situation. Now his or her word causes me to fear that fasting will cause me harm. So that's fine. Then then I can go based on the basis of that. I have a legitimate um, reason for concern. I don't need to fast. Now let's say that the doctor says something, but you know I know myself, I know my body, um, I have experience. Um, the doctors doesn't really understand the situation. I know better in that case, then I don't have to listen to the doctor. And um, in fact, if if I'm certain that it's not gonna cause me that harm that the doctor is talking about, then I do have to fast. By the way, if you have any comments on the slides um, as we're going through, please do type them out. I'm looking at the window as well. Okay, let's say that somebody, you know, does, say you know, there's some people who are like really gung-ho like they, they have to fast right so they say that you know what i'm just gonna fast i don't care if it's gonna cause me harm if i'm sick i'm not gonna, whatever i'm just no, no matter what i'm gonna fast so this is in many cases problematic because in many cases if it's a case that you know we fast knowing that it's gonna make us sicker or we know that it's gonna cause harm to our body then it actually um it's not gonna be valid and in some cases it's haram as well you know so um, we have to realize that this is the mercy of Allah upon us. He wants us to, to um, in, the, in the same verses of the Quran that we had read, Allah says, um, Allah desires ease for you and doesn't desire difficult, difficulty for you. This is one of the cases where Allah doesn't want us to fast when we're, when we're sick. So um, when, when, according to the rules, when, when somebody makes an intention to fast, when sickness is affected, like I know that it's going to make me sicker, for example, I know it's going to make me sick to fast, 
or there's a fear of harm that's not correct. Now, Atul Sani has a particular opinion on this, but I'm just giving it a general opinion that that if um, there's fear of harm also, then it's not correct. Um, Ayatul Sani says that if I fear that fasting will be harmful, but the harm is not extreme, I can fast with the intention of Raja. Um, again, if you guys need any, any clarification on anything, please do let me know. Um, and if it is not harmful, then my fast will be correct. So this is like, let's say that I'm not, you know, like, I'm not sure if this is going to be, I think it might be harmful for me, but I'm not sure. Ayatul Sani says that, okay, you can go ahead and fast. And if it turns out that it's not harmful for you, then then your fast will be valid, but you have to do it with the niyyah of raja. Now, raja means a hope of this being something that's counted, not the niyyah of um, it being something which is wajib. Now, let's say that somebody's fasting and then along the way, like things get difficult. For example, let's say that somebody, um, you know, they weren't able to do the suhoor. They, they slept in or something, they forgot to wake up. And then they're fasting in the day and they get very, very like um, thirsty um, and it becomes something which is like unbearable. You know, like they have extreme weakness or extreme difficulty. So in that case, um, they are permitted to um, eat or drink the amount necessary um, in order to like, get out of that you know, very extreme situation. But then for the rest of the, the day, they would have to refrain from eating or drinking anymore and they would do Qada. So this would apply, for example, if somebody, like I said, they didn't do a suhoor and let's say they, they're, they're working out in the field somewhere really hot and then maybe the situation would arise. Or let's say that it's difficult, but not to the point of unbearable difficulty, but it is the point where I'm uncap uncapable, incapable of doing that work that I need to do. Like it's something like this is my only job that I can get. I can't do anything else. I have to do this thing. And it's basically making me that I can't, you know, earn this money, and I have to, be, I have, to, I have to get this money in order to make my livelihood. In that case, then that would also be a case where um, you'd be able to do um, to to break the fast, eat the amount, or drink the amount necessary, and then refrain from eating or drinking after that, and then making up the qada later on. Okay, and and the elderly, um, if elderly, if there's an elderly person who, because of their old age. Um, it's just it's just hard for them to fast. You know, it's 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 too much difficulty, and they're also exempted from fasting as well. We'll talk about the consequences of them not doing meaning that what would they have to do in terms of giving charity. Now, um, if there's a woman who is expecting, um, now, if she if she fears, um, that fasting is going to harm her or the child's health, um, then fasting is not an obligation. And in fact, it's going to be prohibited um, if there's going to if there's fear of harm, according to Ayatollah Khamenei, or Ayatollah Khamenei says that if it's if the harm is extreme, then it's going to be prohibited. But it's not an obligation. So the example is that let's say that there's a lady who is expecting, and then she goes for her ultrasound, and the doctor says that okay, you need to eat frequent meals and to ensure proper growth of the child. That would be so. She her fear of harm is based on rational grounds, which is that she got this thing from the doctor. Um, so it's, she's, it's, it's, it's legitimate concern that she has. Um, but sometimes there's a, there's a misconception. Is it the case that anybody, any lady who is expecting that she has an exception from fasting? The answer is no. There are some um, cases where there's no fear for there being harm. She's capable of, of fasting and there's no such fear. In that case, then it would be an obligation on her. Another case is that if there's a woman who is feeding, and her milk supply is low, okay, and if she fears, that, again, that fasting is going to harm her, her or the child's health, then fasting is not obligatory. Um, some ladies have noticed that fa when, they're, when they're fasting, and um, then this will, it makes the, the milk supply, like, decrease. And some, some people don't, some say that, no, it doesn't have an effect on it. But let's say that she has fear that it will um, cause this, and this will cause, like, a harm to the child's health as well, then it's something that, um, would not be an obligation on her. She would have to make it up later on. Now, Ayatul Sistani, if you look at the fatwas, Ayatul Sistani says that if, the, if there's an alternative available, then she has to use it. And one of the examples that's mentioned is like um, a powdered formula. Um, but here, if it's the case that the parents, like they, they see the powdered formula, the infant formula as being potentially harmful to the health, um, then they don't have to use it. And it seems that as you know, these days the research is pointing in that direction, like that that um the the 
mother's milk is so important for the child that um, using an alternative is not something which um, which is really uh, an alternative in the form of powdered milk is not something which is a viable option. Okay, now um, the next topic is what if I have qada fast to make up? So this is important, especially now that we're getting close to the end of the month of Sha'ban. Um, and you know what? What is it? What is our obligation when it comes to any fast that we might ha might have um, qada from last uh, month of Ramadan? Okay, so first of all, let's say that um, you know making up qada fast is wajib. Um, it's it's something which uh, is one of the obligations that sometimes people you know they don't tend to take maybe necessarily take that seriously, but it is something which is um, very important that when it comes to um, you know, part of doing toba is not just <clears throat> feeling sorry over our past mistakes um, and resolving not to commit a sin, the same sin, but also making up qada, making up, compensating for the past, um, and compensating for the past, making taking that seriously is something which is wajib. Now, um, let's say that somebody you know has a number of fasts that are qada from the past, maybe because they were traveling or they were sick or. Um, for some reason, for me, they didn't fast. They didn't know about fasting, for example. Um, but they're not sure how many fasts they have to make up. In that case, what they need to do is they need to like come up with an estimate of what is the least number of fasts that they know they have to make up. And a lot of times, like you know, people have asked and then they come to me and they say, okay, you know what? When we were younger, you know, we didn't really keep track. So that's fine. You didn't keep track, but at least now you can come up with a with a least number. Of the definitely with these many fasts that I didn't do, so that's the part that's wajib. Okay, like doing the doing the most number is mustaha, but 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 the, the part is wajib is the least number. So let's say I'm not sure if I have to do ten or fifteen, then ten would be wajib. Now I told the has a, a special um, caveat there. He says that there's one case where like you know where um, you wouldn't be able to go by just the lower bound. It's like where you know you you know that you stop fasting on a certain date, um, but then you're not sure when the end date of your travel was. Um, so here, for example, let's say that you stopped on the 10th and you went traveling, and then you came back either on the 15th or the 16th. In that case, the 6th would be wajib. But if it's not like that, if it's something where it's just, you know, generally speaking, I really don't know, maybe because of sickness um, or because of just negligence, whatever, I don't know, then we need to come up with a lower amount number. That's the way to go up. Now, do I have to make up a qada fast before the next month of Ramadan? So let's say in last last year, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, for I was sick for five days, for example. Now, now the month of Shaban is coming to end. Month of Ramadan is coming up. If I do taqlid al Atul Khamenei, it's ihtiyat wajib for me to make up those fasts by this next month of Ramadan. If I don't, then I've committed a sin. Um, according to Atul it's something which is mustahab. But even according to Atul even though it's mustahab, it is. Um, somebody can't take this like lightly. They can't take it, be like, okay, because it's mustahab, therefore I don't have to do it. Um, I can just wait for many, 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 many years. Um, it has to be something which is where they're not taking it lightly. Okay, now, be, so qada is something that, um, that that's there. Now, what about penalties? Now, um, there's two types of penalties when it comes to fasting. One of them is fidya, one of them is kafara. And uh, sometimes the terms are used interchangeably, but generally speaking, fidya it refers to like a smaller um, penalty or even you could say like a charity um, that is uh, an obligation at times. And kafara is a large penalty um, due to like a sinful act. So when is it that fidya and kafara um, are wajib? That's what we're going to talk about um, here. So first of all, about fidya, what is fidya? Fidya um, is feeding a poor Muslim or according uh, to a Shia um, one mud of food and mud is a, is a certain quantity of food which is about three fourths of a kilogram 750 grams of food now this is different than giving somebody a meal or making somebody giving enough, enough food to fill up somebody so that they're full it's about giving them one mud of food. Um, and this can be given, uh, if somebody has multiple you know, fidyas to give, they can give it all to one needy person and one needy Muslim or needy Muslim Shia. 
Um, but it must be delivered as food, not as money to buy food, not as just charity. So you can, it's, it's not valid to just take that amount of money and put it in the sadqa box. Um, it has to be given as food to that poor person. It can be given through somebody, like through an agency, through an organization, but it has to be food at the end of it. Okay, so let's look at the consequences for not fasting due to a valid excuse. So, um, so gift cards wouldn't be acceptable either because um, it has to be the actual food itself. Okay. Um, now, let's say that, so what are the cases? Now, no, um, when it comes to somebody who misses their fast, okay, if you just look at the two, two yellow boxes, okay, if somebody misses the fast because of a valid reason, one of two consequences are going to be in place. Either they will have to, um, either they will have to give qada, or they have to give qada and a fidya. Okay. Now, when is it that they have to give qada and a fidya? It's in the two cases which had to do with a mother and her child. If there's a nursing mother who, because of fearing low milk supply, she, um, she doesn't fast in that case she has to do qada and give fidya for each fast that she doesn't um she doesn't perform um let's say there's a nursing mother but she doesn't fast because of another concern not because of low milk supply um there's some other reason like for example she's sick or she fears harm to her health or something because um, of fasting then in that case she would only have to do the qada not the fidya but if it's because of low milk supply she has to give the fidya same thing with an expecting mother who fears harm um, if she's near to delivery. So like, let's say she's, she's in her ninth month, she's close to delivery. In that case, she would have to do qada and fidya for each fast that she missed. However, if there's somebody who misses the fast because they were just sick or the fasting would prolong their sickness or their fear, they, they're concerned about getting sick because of fasting, or there's an expecting mother who fears harm, but it's not near her delivery. Let's say she's only in her sixth month or seventh month or third month. Um, or there's a traveler or um, a lady because of Hayd and Nifas, she's not able to fast. In that case, it's just Qadha, not a fidya. Okay? Again, if you have any questions or clarification, please do type it out. Now, if somebody is sick, you said that one of the cases is when they're sick, they have to make Qadha. Why is it that nine months is different than any other month of pregnancy? Um, this is the this is according to the instructions of the Ahlul Bayt um, that the fidya is given. And you know, if you look at the philosophy behind it, it seems that um, when the reason for not fasting is somebody other than myself, like other than the oneself, then that's when um, the charity has to be given in addition to like you know, making up the qada later on. So in this case, in the ninth month, um, because the child is is very, you know, the, is prominent and they're, they're the cause for, um, you know, the, the mother not fasting, in that case, they would have to do the, the fidya as well. Okay, now um, let's say that somebody is ill, okay, and the illness, we said that it's, they have to do qada, but let's say that the, the illness lasts for a whole year, even beyond the month of Ramadan. In that case, then um, they wouldn't need to do the qada anymore. Um, they would just have to give uh, a fidya, and that's it. Okay, so so we said in the previous slide that that an ill person doesn't need to give fidya, they just, they, they just have to give qada, but, but in the case that the, the illness lasts till next month, well, then um, they wouldn't. They would have to give the fidya. So let's say, for example, somebody has a diabetes condition. It's something which is, you know, it's it's, it's with them. You know, that it's going to be there for the whole year. Um, in that case, and, and it's preventing them from fasting. Then um, they wouldn't. They would have to just give a fidya um, when the next month of Ramadan comes around for for not being able to make it up during the year. And they would give for each day of the month, so be third, you know, twenty nine or thirty fidyas for each day of the month they weren't able to fast. We mentioned that one of the um, cases for not fasting not being obligation is for the elderly. Now, in the elderly, there's two cases that there's one case where because of their old age, it's very difficult for them to fast. In the other case, it's that they just can't fast. It's impossible for them to fast. Um, and <clears throat> in that case, if it's difficult, then they do have to give fidya for each fast that they miss. And if it's impossible, then they don't need to give fidya for each day they miss. And then there's a Special thing, what happens if now like they were unable to, but then something happens, they get better, and now they are able to fast. Then what about those fasts that they missed? Um, a queen Ayatollah Khamenei, they would have to make up those fasts that are missed. There's a question which says that what if they do fast knowing that they're diabetic? 
Um, now, there's some people who are, di who are diabetic where fasting um, is not uh, something that would cause harm to them. There's no reason that they fear that it would cause harm to them. Um, in that case, uh, fasting is wajib for them. But let's say that they're diabetic and then they fear or they know that harm is going to be caused um, to them. So, um, and, and it actually does cause harm to them. Um, then their fasting is not something which is uh, valid. Um, and according to some maraja, it's going to be haram. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, if, if, if somebody has dementia, so again, if one of the conditions for fasting being an obligation is that they have to be sane. So if, if it's at the point where um, you know they don't have that sanity, they don't understand, they don't have the, the awareness and understanding of like the fasting, these sort of things, then there's no obligation for the fasting and they don't have to give the fidya as well. Okay, um, what are the consequences for, let's say you de delay making up. Okay, now we said that, um, that, uh, Yes. Um, so, so let's say that let's say that I we we talked about the fidya when it comes to you know like a lady who's expecting and she can't fast, and a lady who fears the milk low supply. There's another type of fidya that comes up when I delay doing the qada um, past the month of Ramadan. So you know, let's say somebody had a whole year where they were supposed to make up the qada and they didn't do it for whatever reason. Now, Queen Ayatul Sistani, um, for each fast that was missed, fidya is going to be obligatory. Um, so, for example, last month of Ramadan, let's say I had four fasts, I was supposed to make them up, I was lazy, um, I didn't get around to doing them, I would still have to make them up, you know, for after this coming month of Ramadan, but for each one of those fasts, then I would have to give a fidya as well. Um, now, this fidya is a one-time penalty for delay. It doesn't get repeated if the qada is delayed till the next year or beyond. So let's say that somebody has some fasts to make, but they didn't do it in the first year, they have to give a fidya for each one of those fasts they didn't make up in the first year. And then beyond that, if they delay even further years, then they don't have to give a fidya for each one of the years after that. That was according to Ayatollah According to Ayatollah Khamenei, he says that it depends now. Was there a valid excuse for not doing so, for them not making up the qada? For example, let's say somebody, they wanted to do the qada, um, but they were traveling in the whole time. And so they never were able to like fast. Right? Um, in that case, then... Um, they wouldn't have to give the uh, fidya, but if there's no valid, they were they were just being lazy. They they just being negligent. In that case, they would have to give the fidya for each for the fast that they weren't able to make up. Okay, about fidya, you can appoint a wakil, an agent, um, who will take the money and distribute it on your behalf. I mean, he'll take money from you and then he'll buy the food and give it to the poor people. That's fine. It's not wajib to give it right away. But it shouldn't be delayed negligently. So let's say this, for example, somebody, you know, this uh, we get this question from from some of the like the younger um, youth. As they say that look at like we you know we have to give fidya, but we don't have our own money. Um, so then what do we do in that case? Well, um, they can they can, they can get the money from their parents um, if their parents give it to them. But it's not wajib for their parents to give it to them, or they can just wait until they do get uh, money and then they can give it at that time. Now, um, we said that that was fidya. What about kafara? Kafara is the major penalty, and that's when somebody deliberately breaks their fast. In that case, um, they have to not only make up the qada, but then for each day, um, they have to um, either feed 60 individual poor people. What I mean by individually, meaning that not just giving 60 portions to one person, but like feed 60 individual people to their fill, or give each one of them one mud. A food, food. We said that mud is 750 grams, um, and it can't be to the to the individuals who are wajib enough. I mean, that somebody can't just feed their own family. Like, let's say that, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to have a big feast for my own family, and then so, sorry, no, it has to be like people who are outside of, the, of one's wajib dependence. And according to something, has to be a mu'min. Um, or the other alternative is fasting for two months. So when when the fast is broken with something haram, let's say that na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, somebody wants to break their fast with alcohol. Okay, um, in that case then, or they would do zina to break their fast, for example. Um, then it's mustahab according to these marajah um, to give both kafars, I mean both the fasting for two months and the feeding of the poor people. Um, you might have, of course, you know, we, 
probably have um, you know learned in the past and that there's a third option as well too for the kafara which is freeing a slave but because that's not something which is valid um, in today's world i haven't put it on the slides okay when, when does the kafara apply kafara applies when um, one of these things is done intentionally um, eating and drinking intentionally on purpose sexual intercourse intentionally is them not um, meaning that somebody uh, does something to cause, um, you know, um, money to be uh, released, um, for example, masturbation. Um, remaining in the state of Janaba um, till Fajr intentionally, um, that would be a cause for um, somebody's kaf for kafara to apply. Now, if somebody does this but they're ignorant, let's say they didn't know they didn't know that. For example, that they, that you can't remain in the state of Janaba until Fajr, um, then kafara would not apply, unless um, somebody was their ignorance was not excusable, meaning that they should have known this. Meaning that, for example, they they had access to the teachings, but they just, just chose not to go and learn. Um, they knew about this seminar, for example, but they were like, you know what, I'd rather rather not or something. Okay, in that case, then, um, okay, in that case, then. Uh, if if that's the case, meaning that they're they're jahil muqassir, meaning they should have known better, um, and it was a question that came up for them, and they didn't research it. In that case, then um, they would have to get the kafara. Okay, when does fidya become wajib? And when does kafara become wajib? So fidya becomes wajib. Fidya becomes wajib. Um, it depends on what the fidya is for. We said that fidya. There's two types of fidya that we talked about. Fidya is um, this one right here, if you talk about the nursing mother or the expecting mother, um, fidya becomes wajib uh, once she um, okay. Um, fidya becomes wajib once she um, once she doesn't fast. Like me, as soon as she doesn't fast, then fidya becomes wajib. Okay. Um, so an expecting mother who fears harm or a nursing mother is not able to fast, it becomes wajib once she doesn't fast. Okay, when it comes to um, this fidya that we talked about here, which is that um, where somebody delays making up the qada before the next month of Ramadan, then as soon as they become sure, certain that, um, as soon as they become certain that they're not going to be able to make up the fast in time, for the for this month of Ramadan, that's when it becomes wajib on them. Okay, so let's say that, for example, somebody has like, you know, uh, ten fasts to make up, and there's only one day left in the month of Sha'aban. Then from now they the, for the nine um, fasts, they're not they know they know they're not going to be able to make up nine fasts. Then they can the fidya becomes wajib on, on them for that. They can pay that at that time. Okay, um, but this wajib isn't something which is uh, it has to be done right away. Um, so it's a wajib that has time. Uh, so whenever they are able to do it, they can do it whenever they get around to it. As long as they don't treat it like something which is not important, important or become negligent about it. Okay. Kafara is the same. If kafara becomes wajib um, when somebody um, does that act uh, of which, you know, breaking their fast, you know, for example, they eat or drink in the daytime when they, there's no excuse for doing so. Okay, um, what is Janaba? Janaba is um, the state that somebody enters into um, when they, um, there's a few different uh, causes for it, but one of them, for example, is um, when there is um, sexual intercourse that takes place, um, that would cause some, uh, you know, both parties to enter into state of Janaba. Um, and also, um, you know, uh, some other conditions as well too, that's, that cause somebody to go into, enter into the state of Janaba. Okay. Um, okay. Somebody is just having issues with the audio. I just want to send them a message. So I'll we'll continue in just a minute. Okay. 
let's continue. Um, okay. Now, um, according to Ayatollah Khamenei, it's a bit different. Um, he says that if any of the acts mentioned is done intentionally, um, these four things that we mentioned, even the other ones as well too, that we're going to be covering, those things that that um, will break uh, a fast, for example, um, vomiting intentionally and the other ones, any of them are done intentionally, then um, that would necessitate the kafara. And he just says if somebody's ignorant about that, then it doesn't apply. Now let's do a let's do a let's do a scenario here. Okay, let's say that I had seven fasts to make up from the last month of Ramadan due to travel and illness, but I only got around to making up three of them before the new month of Ramadan has arrived. What is my responsibility with regards to the remaining four fasts? Um, can somebody, uh, wanna, any one of you want to type out an answer for that? Okay, good. Um, so, so most of you are getting it correct. The answer is that um, I would need to make up the remaining four fasts after this month of Ramadan. So, Qada still is there, and um, I have to give four fidyas uh, because um, I wasn't able to make uh, because of the delay. I have to give the four fidyas, unless according to Ayatul Khamenei, somebody is doing something Ayatul Khamenei, and he says that if, if I wasn't able to do it because of a valid excuse, in that case, I wouldn't have to do the fidya. Okay. All right, let's do another scenario, um, which is that I had three fasts to make up from the last month of Ramadan due to inexcusable negligence, meaning I should have fasted, but I didn't, I just, I was just, I said, you know, I was really, I was lazy, whatever, but I didn't do so before the following month of Ramadan. What is my responsibility in that case? Okay, you almost got it. So you you got you are, you're mentioning qada and kafara and fidya, right? We will need to do all three of them, right? The so um, first of all, because you know, like um, you know, leaving aside an obligation of Allah is something which is a great matter. Um, it's a sin. So for that, we have to do istighfar. Um, and then in addition, there's a qada for the three fasts. There's three fidyas for the delay, and there's three kafaras for deliberately not fasting. Okay. Does anybody need clarification on this? Going once, going twice. Any, if there's any, because I want to make sure that everyone um, is clear on this one, and then we can go on. Okay. Um, so there was a couple of questions that were typed. Um, that let's say that there's a, a a lady who doesn't have her money, then can she use her husband's money for the fidya? If her husband gives her the money to give the fidya, or gives her the food that she's gonna then um, go and give to of the poor person, then she then she can she can do that. But but of course she wouldn't be able to just take her husband's money without um, the permission. I mean her husband isn't obligated to give it to her for for the for the fidya. Um, and then there's a question about somebody who was um, I have a friend who was who became Shia and was not was she not a Muslim or she was a Muslim? So maybe you can clarify that uh, about the one about the question about them not being a Shia. And then there's another question about three kafara meaning feeding 180 people. Um, yes, uh, you can you can feed sixty people poor people, um, and then you can feed the same sixty poor people three times, or you can feed one hundred and eighty people. Yeah. What is the difference between uh, fidya and kafara? Um, fidya is a small uh, penalty or a small amount of charity, and kafara is a large penalty. So fidya is seven hundred and fifty grams of food. Um, that's given to the poor person. A kafara is feeding sixty 
it's either either feeding 60 people or people to their fill or giving them 750 grams of food each one of them or um, it's fasting for 60 days okay the next topic is what does um, traveling the fact does traveling have on my fasting um and Yeah, so when it comes to um, if somebody's too poor to um, pay the fidya, um, this is something that I didn't cover in this presentation because it's, uh, the rules were a little bit um, uh, complicated for that. Um, but uh, if that's something, something that somebody is... Um, okay. Um, now, uh, regarding the amount, uh, again, fidya is the amount that you would pay for one poor person. It's not going to be $22. Um, that's 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 way too much. Um, it's about, you know, like uh, if you think about three-fourths of a kilo of of wheat, um, it doesn't cost anywhere near that amount. Okay, $22 for the entire month. That's something which is much more, um, much more reasonable. Um, but again, it's not about the number you if, if if you're going to give money to an organization then they have to take that money and turn it into food and um, they're going to deliver to the poor people okay something um and then uh before you continue can you show the slide about what ayatollah khamenei says about qada fast sure okay so if if somebody delays making up the qada fast before the next month of ramadan then Either, the, either there was a valid excuse for the delay or not a valid excuse for the delay. If there wasn't a valid excuse, then they have to do give a fidya and to do the qala. If there was a valid excuse, then they would just have to give the qala. According to Khamenei. According to Sani, they would always have to give the qala, the, the fidya, if they delay. Okay. Um, let's go on. So what is uh, what is traveling, what effect does traveling have on my fasting? First of all, am I allowed to travel during the month of Ramadan? The answer is that yes, um, we're allowed to travel at any time during the month of Ramadan. Um, although doing so can be makru. Um, some say some some fuqaha say this throughout the month it's makru. Some say that at least until the twenty third day, um, it's makru, um, unless there's some valid reason. For example, somebody wants to go, um, you know, there's some some good purpose is a good excuse for why they have to travel for some good action or whatever it may be maybe it's make, making their livelihood making ends meet then it's okay for them to travel um just as a side note here i found it very interesting there was yes for example for the al quds rally definitely um there's a, a very good uh, uh, story i read of uh, one of the great ulama who um, his daughter had just turned nine years old and one day she, for whatever reason, she didn't wake up for the suhoor and she was finding it difficult to fast, not to the point where it was wajib on, where, where, she, where it, was, uh, it was permissible for her to break the fast, but it was something which is really hard for her. So um, the story said that this great alim went with his daughter and actually traveled with her to you know a certain point where beyond which um, it would be valid for him to break his fast and he broke his fast and then he ate with her and then they came back. So. We have even like you know great uh, ulama sometimes you know they I mean, they, they because there's a compelling reason they would they would travel and they would miss the fast and they would make it up later on. Um, of course you know being able to keep fast in the month of Ramadan has a special baraka and it is emphasized. But if somebody has a valid excuse, then it's a valid excuse. Okay, now um, let's say somebody does is a traveler, um, then even if they're traveling, it's still mustahab for them to stay away from food, drink, and during the daytime of the month of Ramadan. Um, so it doesn't mean that okay because I'm I'm traveling then you know I, I should necessarily just go and and you know, treat it like forget about the fact that it's not Ramadan. Okay, um, now if I travel I'm exempted from fasting and my fasting is invalid. I can't fast in the month of Ramadan. I can't fast um, unless uh, these conditions are the case. I'm planning to stay in a place for more than ten, ten days or more. I'm considered to be a frequent traveler. I'm traveling to my watan or the travel is sinful. If any of these are, are the case, then um, I would not be accepted from fasting. I would still have to fast. Okay, the other thing is now, now let's say that I'm traveling, um, but I leave 
the city boundary after Dhuhr. In that case, then um, I still have to keep my fast for that day. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm you know, taking a flight overseas, but my flight leaves at like 3 p.m. and Salat al Dhuhr is at 1.30 p.m. Um, in that case, then I would, um, I would, in that case, then I would um, be able, I would have to keep my fast from leaving after Dhuhr. Um, no, we're not allowed to even keep mustahab fast when traveling. Okay, um, now, what if I cross into the city boundary? So now, let's say that I'm out of town, but I'm coming back home before Dhuhr. Now, if um, in the morning time before I got home, I didn't do anything to break my fast, if I had been fasting, I didn't have breakfast, for example, I didn't do anything else that would otherwise break my fast. Once I enter into my um, hometown, then I would have to fast. Um, I would just make the intention of fasting from that point and then um, keep the fast for the rest of the day. But if um, if I if I uh, did happen to, let's say, have breakfast, for example, and then I come in before Dhuhr, then um, I wouldn't be able to keep the fast for that day. Um, but um, with regards to the rest of the day, then um, is it permissible for me to eat or drink for the rest of the day? Um, that's something which um, I'm having a doubt on right now, whether it's wajib or mustahab to stay away from food for the rest of the day. I believe it's mustahab, but that's something that um, if it um, that I would encourage you to, to look up or check, or you can contact me. I can let you know, inshallah, what the, the answer is on that. Okay, the other condition is that if somebody is a frequent traveler, let's say that they're a frequent traveler, um, in that case, then they can fast even though they're a frequent traveler. Now, what is a frequent traveler? traveler? Um, According to Ayatollah Khamenei, if somebody's work, um, if, if, if it's for the purpose of work that they're traveling to a different city, then if they ever travel three times um, in, in, without there being a 10-day gap in between the travels, then upon the third trip, they would become a frequent traveler. So let's say, for example, that um, I live in Toronto and I travel to... Um, I don't know, let's say um, Montreal. Okay, these are two different cities. They're, they're, they're very far apart. Like maybe, I don't know, five, six hours drive. I live in Toronto. I travel to Montreal for work. Um, and I go there, um, you know, I go there every, um, I go there for a few days and then I come back for, let's say, five days. Then I go there for a few days. I come back for five days. Um, and it's for the purpose of work. In that case, because the gap in between my travelers, travels is less than 10 days, it's for the purpose of work. Um, my, I would be a, I would be a frequent traveler according to Ayatollah Khamenei. Um, for a student who has to travel for the purpose of studying, like let's say that you know they live in one city, my university is in another study, I end up traveling there like every day, for example, and um, it's enough of a distance where I would be considered I would be considered a traveler according to the Sharia. In that case, then um, he says that you have to act according to Ithya. This is something that's just fairly new. Um, at least from my understanding that Ayatul Khamenei has given this opinion that you have to that you would do ihtiyat, meaning that um, you would refer to another marja's opinion on that if you're a student. Um, and otherwise if you if you stayed with Ayatul Khamenei's opinion, then you would have to both pray full and pray short um, and keep the fast and make the qala for it as well too. Again if you need any clarification please do um, let me know. Um, and then Ayatollah Khamenei says that if you ever stay in a place for 10 days in a row and then don't go, to, let's say you are a frequent traveler and then you have a 10 day gap. At that point, then you would no longer be a frequent traveler um, unless you started up the travel again. And then after the second traveler, you would you'd be a frequent traveler. According to Ayatollah Sistani, he says that you become a frequent traveler when you intend to be in a state of travel for either six months of the upcoming year um, or three months of the upcoming year and three months in the next year and then each month you would travel for 10 days approximately meaning that maybe some days you travel 11 days and some months you travel nine days but roughly speaking you're traveling 10 days a month for at least six months of the year for one year now um let's say that somebody is a frequent traveler um, does that mean that when they, whenever they travel, um, they would be fasting and they would pray full? 
Or is it just when they travel for the purpose why they became a frequent traveler? Like let's say that somebody travels for the purpose of work and that's why they're a frequent traveler. This is where you have a different opinion among the Maharaj. Um, Ayatollah Khamenei says that um, if you're a frequent traveler for work, then you would still um, pray shortened prayers and not be able to fast on other non-work travelers on travels. But Ayatollah Sistani says that if you are a frequent traveler, um, then whenever you travel, um, whether it be for, let's say you're a frequent traveler because you're a university student, then whenever you travel, let's say you're going on vacation, whatever it is, then you would always pray full and then you would be able to fast on your travelers, on your travels, um, as long as you had that that um, title of being a frequent traveler. Traveler. Now, um, let's say you are traveling. When is it that we are allowed to break our fast? The answer is that we're allowed to break the fast once you've traveled past the Hadd al tarakhus okay? And you're intending to travel the required distance, which is um, eight farsakh round trip or four farsakh one way, which is approximately 22 kilometers. Um, sometimes people have a, uh, they, they say that, what if we don't know? What if we're not sure whether we've gone that amount or not? Um, because we're not, for example, we're not sure, example, for example, where the city limit is, like we're in a state of doubt. In that case, then if you're in a state of doubt, you're not sure, then you can assume that you haven't um, traveled, you're, you're, then, that you haven't traveled that required distance. I mean, you haven't, that you're not traveling that required distance for it to be considered a, um, a travel according to the Sharia. Um, so th just note here that there's a difference between how far you're intending to travel and when you can actually break your fast. Um, you don't have to travel you know, 22 kilometers away from the city in order to break your fast. You just have to travel past Hadid Tarakhus in order to break your fast. But overall, you have to be intending to travel um, at least that amount of distance of the four farsakh or 22 kilometers. So let me give you a scenario here. Let's say that somebody um, travels from work to work from Toronto to Ottawa. Ottawa is a city. It's, I don't know, maybe three, four hours away from Toronto. And they go three days at times a week. Okay, now I, I go three times a week. I couldn't take off during Ramadan, so I still have trouble. No worries, I tell myself, as I pop a date in my mouth, once my bus leaves the terminal, I'll just make it up after the month of Ramadan. Um, is there anything wrong with this particular scenario? Any, anything wrong with this person? Okay, that's one thing that's wrong. And that's the second thing. Is that one thing is wrong that is that they're a frequent traveler, yes. And another one is um, that somebody private messaged me and said that he's still in the city. So um, exactly, like so um, as somebody who travels out of town that frequently for work, I'm going three times a week, then um, I, I'm able to fast when I'm traveling and I have to pray full. So if I eat something deliberately, I have to give qada and fidya and kafara. Uh, sorry, qada and kafara. Also, when traveling 44 kilometer round trip, I'm allowed to break my fast only if I leave before Dhuhr and after passing the Hadat Tarakhus. So um, if, I haven't, if I'm just sitting in the bus, I'm ready to go, I'm on the plane, I'm ready to go to China or something. So I start e eating like, you know, in the plane. No, I have to first leave the Hadat Tarakhus and that's when, I have to pass the Hadat Tarakhus, that's when I can. Um, the other thing we said is what, if somebody's in their Watan, then even if they're there for less than 10 days, then they can fast and they um, would pray full. Now, Watan isn't, normally, a lot of people like they translate Watan to mean like birthplace. Um, and that is one of the meanings for Watan in Arabic, but when it comes to the Sharia, Watan has a specific meaning. Um, Watan is a place that, um, you know, you are uh, a place of residence and you can take on new places of residence. Um, how can you take on a new place of residence? If you have intention to settle down there. Um, even for a temporary period of time. Ayatul Asthani says that um, if you're there long enough that you would no longer be considered a traveler, for example, one and a half years or more, if let's say you're there full time for one and a half years, approximately, then uh, you would you can you can consider that place to be your Watan. And Ayatul Khamenei also says that um, you know if you're if it's a bit longer, if you're planning to settle down in a place for example, seven to eight years so that you'll be considered a resident of that place, then it would be considered one of your weapons as well.
Now, how long do I have to stay in a new watan before it takes on the rules of a watan? According to Ayat al-Sani, a month. According to Ayat al-Khamini, um, a few nights. Can your parents' home be your watan even if you live in a different, different place? Um, yes, your parents' home can be a watan. Um, it depends on what we're going to talk about right now, which is that how does a, a place, how does a place stop becoming my watan? So let's say um, there's a lady who used to have uh, her parents' home and where she grew up, like let's say that's, or, or where her parents were, that was her watan. Now she gets married, she moves to a different city. Is her parents' home still a watan or not? It depends on what the intention was when you leave your watan. If you leave with the intention of what is called arab, which means that you're 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 leaving, like you're 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 um you're basically like um you know you're you're no longer gonna be there anymore and you don't have an intention to like come back. Um you're turning away from that place, basically, um literally. In that case, then you that place will no longer be your what then. But let's say you leave a place, but there's a possibility that you might come back. You know, like there's, there's, it's not like you're leaving for good. You know, there's, it's like, it's something where you're leaving, but, you know, let's say there's a 10% chance, 15% chance or something that you'll come back in that case, then um, that would still be your what then. So when you go back that even for a couple of days, then you could fast and you could pray full. So it depends on the intention that you have when you're leaving that place. Um, so let's do another scenario here. It's the month of Ramadan. And let's say it's something wrong. Okay, it's a scenario. After five years, I get to go back home and spend the last portion of the month with my family there, wherever back home is. However, my schedule is tight and I only have a week to spend there, but I'm thankful for whatever I have. Okay, is there any 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 concerns I have to have about this this particular plan that I have? Um, no? Okay. Right, that's fine. Um, the person won't be able to fast. Um, yeah, that's a concern, which is that um, if if I left back home five years ago with the intention of not coming back to live there again, then I won't be able to fast when I stay there for a week. It's not haram to go, but they should know they're not going to be able to fast. This is because I'll be considered a traveler who stays in another city for less than 10 days, and therefore I can't fast and my prayers will be shortened. So it's not haram for them to go, but they should realize that um they uh, you know if, if they left with the intention of not going back then if they're only going to be there for a week's time then they won't be able to partake in all the blessings of the month of Ramadan because they won't be able to fast okay what are some of the things that break the fast um we just have a couple of minutes left um in the seminar i think that it goes until 3 45 eastern time or is it four o'clock um Yeah, it's still 345. So um, let's just go through uh, a few of these slides and then inshallah the presentation will be available to you if you want to go through the rest of the slides. Um, but in the meantime, if there's any questions, then please do type them out um, in the window. Um, what are those things that break the fast? There's food and drink. There's um, liquid enema. There's vomiting, swallowing thick dust and smoke, immersing the head under water. Now this one... Um, I should put a star there, really, because there's this. Uh, Ayatul Zastani has a special ruling on that. He doesn't say it's wajib. He says it's it's um, maku, severely maku, but it's not wajib. It's not haram. Um, spousal relations, it's them not remaining in Janaba after Fajr intentionally, lying about Allah and His Prophet. So we'll just go through a few of these. Istimna um, is when um, somebody uh, does something that would um, cause the release of money um so for example masturbation um you know um i can't so I, obviously you can't eat or drink um during the month of ramadan but let's say somebody has food in their mouth at fajr time well they wouldn't be able to like just finish that they would have to spit it out um if they if they have something, something left at when they're sure that fajr has set in um in order for my fast to be broken eating eating or drinking has to be deliberate um, meaning on purpose, has to be swallowed. 
So if somebody if somebody eats or drinks by mistake, then it doesn't break their fast. Um, they can continue their fast. If they put food in their mouth but they don't swallow it, that doesn't break their fast. Um, from the outside, meaning that if food is if if it comes from if if it if um if, if, let's say somebody some ones like they're swallowing their own saliva, um, then that's fine. Um, about coughing up or spitting up something, we'll talk about that in the, next, in, in, the, in the slide coming up. And it has to be through the mouth as well too, meaning that um, there's some, some of the maharaja would allow um, like uh, an IV, for example, we'll, uh, we have that in the slide coming up. Okay, let's say that, let's say that you're, yeah. Okay, um, so let's say that you're coughing up phlegm, congestion, or mucus, it happens, right? Like where sometimes somebody coughs up and something comes into their mouth. Um, if it doesn't come into the mouth, it only comes into the, the like let's say the chest area. That's fine. You can swallow it back down. But if it does come up to the mouth, then um, according to Ayatollah Sistani, um, you can swallow it. It doesn't break your fast if you do. But Ayatollah Khamenei says the ihtiyat wajib to not swallow it. And if you do swallow it deliberately, then <clears throat> you'd have to do qada and kafara as well too. So. Um, if somebody does follow Ayatollah Khamenei, that comes up in a situation, um, they don't know what they do. They can do ruju to Ayatollah Sistani's opinion on that one, and they, that would allow them to swallow it back down. Okay, um, a couple of questions that you all typed out. Um, one of them is, uh, I heard the intention to break fast is enough to break the fast. It's true. Yes, um, if somebody um, you know, makes the decision, they say that, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to go and uh, uh, drink this glass of water. And then they start making their way there. They, they they make their way there, but then halfway there, they decide they change their mind. They say, you know what, I'm not going to break my fast. Um, as soon as they make the intention to break their fast, whether they actually do it or not, their fast is is broken. They would have to do the qada. Um, and then, how can one be sure of fajr actually setting in, or just going by local fajr times will be sufficient? Um, in order to be sure, um, we have to we have to. Uh, we can't just rely on the timings um, that are there um, because those timings are an approximation. Um, and so that's why we have to um, see like, you know, what, what is it that, the, um, what sort of ihtiyat um, is recommended by the people who put together the timetables of what you, what should you add um, to that time in order to figure out what, you know, when you're going to be sure that Fajr has actually set in. Um, that time could be used, for example, as a, as a, a time for stopping eating. Um, and uh, the time, then you add the number of minutes, like 10, 15 minutes, for example, to be sure that Fajr has actually set in. Um, then another question is, is showering permitted? The answer is that yes, showering is permitted while fasting. Okay. Um, you heard for the... Uh, Balig for girls is the completion of nine years, um, not the beginning of nine years. And for boys, is completion of 15 years, not beginning of 15 years. For um, a girl, it's when she turns nine years old, which means that she's completed nine lunar years. Okay, And um, for a boy, it's when there's the signs of bulugh um, are, are there. And those signs can happen when... They're 15. Um, it can happen before 15 as well, too. Okay, um, we are now um, have reached the end of the time for um, the session. Um, I wanted to thank you for your uh, participation and the questions that you were asking. Um, inshallah, these slides will be uploaded. And then um, there, there were a lot more other um, uh, topics that we were hoping to get to, but um, time did not permit to do so. Um, inshallah, like the common questions that you have would be um, answered by the slides. Um, and if there are any other questions, then um, you can inshallah contact us and we'll try to help out. Um, we ask, we pray, that, pray to Allah to accept these efforts and we pray that everyone is given the tawfiq to be able to perform their obligations to him in this upcoming month and that we are given the opportunity to experience this great uh, month of blessings and rahmah of Allah and that we can make the most out of the opportunity that's given to us. And yes, the audio is um, recorded, so the audio and the slides will be put up on the website, for Ali's website, um, so, soon, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.